some must-have interview tips for the nurse practitioner. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to The Daily Sean. For those of you who haven't been here before, my name is Sean. I do a daily video on something related to nursing. No rhyme or reason. Probably not going to change. What are some must-have interview tips for the nurse practitioner? This was a great question. I've been asked it quite a bit lately. It's been kind of becoming more and more frequent. I'm having a lot of my tribe members, a lot of fans, a lot of friends who have transitioned from the bedside nursing role, went into nurse practitioner program, they have graduated, and now comes time to pay the piper. Oh my god, I graduated, I may or may not have passed my boards, and holy crap, I, I have an interview. What do I do? The good thing is, is that you already know what to do, because you've done it. Nurse practitioner job interviews are pretty much the same as the bedside nursing jobs, with a little bit of a twist. There's at least one thing... There's one category that you have to ask a couple specific questions in regards to your new role. We're gonna dive it, we're gonna dive into that. So without any further ado, let's get started. Number one, bring your portfolio. This is a no-brainer. Bring your portfolio, bring copies of your resume. I would have copies of whatever it is you submitted to them in order to get the interview. And then I would bring, I don't know, letters of recommendation. I would bring anything that is going to help you during the actual interview. Most nurse practitioner job interviews are a bit of a marathon. You're going to interview with many people, not just your immediate supervisor who may or may not actually be an advanced practice provider. They could be an NP, they could be a PA, or it could be a physician. That is not uncommon. Depends on what kind of job you're interviewing for and what certification you have, if you, what role you're in, what environment you're working in. This is going to vary. So when you are interviewing that third person that is like the medical director or is going to be the the, the director of the specific place that you're working or the office manager. There's a lot of people you're going to end up sitting down and chatting with. And maybe they don't have your resume in front of them because somebody forgot to email it to them. Or it's in the mail kind of thing. One of the things that is going to be a feather in your cap is to always have a copy in your possession. If you have multiple copies, that would probably even be better, but it might get a little cumbersome carrying around, so you got to find balance. I, I maybe have two copies. I wouldn't have any more than three, but definitely have at least uno. What are you? When did you become Spanish? Number two, practice questions. Practice the actual interview itself. Have you sitting in front of a mirror, in front of a friend, a family member, someone who is a nurse, someone who's a nurse practitioner, a physician, someone that can sit down with you and practice these questions. Gee, Sean, what questions are you talking about? You know the questions. They're all over the internet. Google the most most common interview questions. It does, you know, I'm I'm not here to list the 30 most common and in popular interview questions. Those are real easy to find. So, I'm not going to go into that. But practice your answers and be prepared. You got to be able, you got to be able to formulate the answer sometimes on the spot and Many times, if you haven't practiced these things, you will freeze. Let me say that again. You will freeze. And, that, and, and, and that's, that's usually not a good thing. Some of the common questions I can think of. Where do you see yourself in five years? Tell me a time you had to deal with a difficult patient. Tell me a time that you had to deal with an uncomfortable situation. What are some of your strengths? What are some of your weaknesses? You get the point. Number three, this is the most important nitty-gritty, down-and-dirty part of the nurse practitioner 
interview. I had to write this stuff down because there's a lot of it, so hang tight. Ask about the contract. Do you have a contract? Do you not have a contract? If you have a contract, is it a cyclical contract that is renewed every year? Or is it something that you have to negotiate and renew every year? Are you hired by a separate practicing group? Or are you being hired by the actual facility? I mean, it, like the hospital. Are you being hired by the hospital? Or are you being hired by a private group? Not all physicians and advanced practice providers are actually employed by the hospital. Something to keep in mind. And it doesn't, doesn't matter. There's no good or bad to that. You just need to be prepared. You need to understand what you are up against. And if you, it is a contract, by golly gee, I hope you read through it. Training and education. What's the nitty gritty on that? How are you going to be trained? How are you going to be... How, what is your orientation like? Now, many, some people call it orientation, some people call it training, does it matter? What you need to find out is, is it a set time frame or is it based upon your performance? And who the heck is doing the orienting and training? Do you have an APP, multiple APPs? Will it be a physician? How will that work? Are you going to be updated every week on how things are going? Do you have a, a orientation manual? Do they give you a manual, that big binder, huge sucker, like this big, that goes over all of the things that you are going to need to learn and do? If you're in a position where you're going to be doing procedures, how will you gain procedural experience? And when and how will that work? I am an acute care nurse practitioner. In the position that I am in, which is the job I interviewed for five years ago when I graduated, there were details that outlined, okay, you're going to have to do this many procedures before you can do it with this much supervision. And that is going to be dictated by state practice acts or employee credentialing office. Kind of like the medical staff committee is going to decide what you as an advanced practice provider can do in their hospital. And that will differ in every hospital. Whether it's small town, large teasing facility, there's going to be a levels of supervision and there's going to be a requirement on how many you can do before someone gives you the check mark and says, okay, they are credentialed and they have the privilege to do this. Within the hospital system you have this privilege to do this thing. It will vary. You need to have the specifics so that you know what you're up against. Oh and, oh, and don't assume that just because Betty Crocker down, down the way and Jimmy John's over in the next county or state does this that you're going to be able to do the same thing. No. It is very specific to your state, locality, and employer know the details. Schedule. What's your schedule going to be like? Are you going to be on a rotating schedule? Are you going to be required to work a certain number of shifts per week, hours per week, shifts per month? Is it on a rotating thing? How will your personal life, how will you find the work-life balance? Do you get so many days off in a row? Do you get so many days off in a month? How do the requests work out? Do you have to do it in two months in advance, six months in advance? What about holidays, weekends, night shift, twilights, overtime, per diem? Exhaust your efforts when it comes to that specific piece of the puzzle. The schedule is going to make or break your life. Think about some of the worst schedules you've worked as a bedside nurse that will be magnified as a nurse practitioner. Know the details. How does the workflow work? How are you working your collaborative agreement with your partnering physicians? Do you have a collaborative agreement? Do you work in a state that recognizes independent practice? If so, how long before that goes into effect? There's a certain number of hours per state practice guidelines and then every employer has their own specific details and requirements. How will 
notes work when you do an H&P or when you do a progress note? How will you sign them? How is billing done in the facility you're working? Are you working under shared time? Do you work as a primary? Do you work as a secondary? Will your practicing collaborating physicians have to sign everything you do? Co-sign everything you do? How will you bill? Are you in the critical care environment? Are you going to bill per critical care time? Are you billing at all? And how will you bill? Will they teach you how to bill? Do you do it by paper, electronic? Know the details. And most importantly, does it really all of that is it's probably a little overwhelming. You better know are they going to actually train you on how to do that stuff? Credentialing. How is credentialing going to work in your facility? How long does it take if you get hired? How long from start to finish, from A to B, will it take before you can actually perform bedside care and actually, quote unquote, touch a patient? <laughs> Yes, they said touch a patient. Credentialing is very important. It doesn't matter if you have your certification. It doesn't matter that they've said, yes, we want you, please come work for us. That does not matter. If the credentialing doesn't go through and you don't have the approved privileges to do to perform the duties that that is part of your job description, you can't do a thing until that takes into effect. And I guarantee you, there is a delay between hire date and when that stuff goes into effect. It can be upwards of three months. And that's after you've taken your certification and you have your state license number. That can take up to three months. Ask for the specifics on credentialing and privileging. Do you have to take care of it? Is there a department who can help you? How is that going to work? Are there opportunities for growth? Professional growth. Are you going to be stuck in this position permanently? Or how does it work every year? Do you get an evaluation? Do you get a raise? Is it based on years of experience? Is it based on performance? Are there QI performance predictors that they're asking for? Do you have to meet a certain number, see a number of patients? Do you have to, to have, for instance, in the critical care world, do you have to go six months without a, uh, you know, a central line infection or, you know, someone for sepsis? Do you follow the sepsis, the, the sepsis guidelines? Those kind of things. Are there QI quality measures that are going to affect your pay and how much control do you have over that so if your practice if a physician meets all these QI quality measures they get a yearly bonus do you get a piece of that how does that work and if you don't get a piece of that how else are you being compensated and rewarded for performing the duties that you're performing or going above and beyond what are, do you have to become part of a committee those kind of things and going along with growth, always ask about continuing education. Will they comp you for continuing education? Do you get an allotted amount of money every year? Or do they, they allow you to go to two conferences or one conference or CEUs and you get this much money, you get a debit card, or how does that work? What kind of money are we talking about? How are they paying for how are you paying for your yearly license, your year, your renewal license, your renewal certifications, or any of the certifications that are required for your job? For me, I have to have advanced trauma life support, ATLS. I have to have ENLS. If you have additional certifications that are required, how are they being paid for? CMEs are very important. You will continue to require them. Are you paying for them by yourself? Because they get pricey. Number four, pay. Most of the time, I would recommend asking for a pay scale. Don't ask flat out, what's this job pay? Because as a new grad, sure, you don't have any nurse practitioner experience, but you do bring experience to the table. 
So, what is their pay scale? Are you being paid as a new grad like someone else? Since one of the things that gets cloudy is as a nurse practitioner, as a brand new nurse practitioner, I had 10 years of nursing experience before I became a nurse practitioner. There are new grad nurse practitioners out there that have zero to less than two years of experience at the bedside. Are they going to get paid the same amount as I get paid? Or do I get some sort of comp for my number of years as a nurse? Because it matters. You earned it. Sell yourself. Number five. Number five. Ask for a time frame. When will they be making a decision on this particular position? Will you know by the end of the interview? Will you know by the end of the week? Do you have to wait two weeks? How many more interviews do they foresee having? When is their hard stop date for when they're going to say, okay, we're going to hire this person? How long before you know? Because guess what? One of the most nerve-wracking and brain-frying things is not knowing what's going on after you leave the interview. Because all you're going to do is think about it. Number six, I recommend doing the Superman pose. If you do not know what the Superman pose is, you should look up the author, Amy Cuddy, A-M-Y, last name Cuddy, C-U-D-D-Y. I'll try and leave the link down in, in the description, if I can remember. Amy Cuddy does a wonderful presentation on uh, kind of like fake it till you make it, but with a little bit of a twist. And it's a really cool 15 minute so TED Talk. There's shortened versions of it. that talk about utilizing the Superman pose. I think y'all know what the Superman pose is. Hands on the waist, chest up, looking out. It sounds corny. I know it does, but it works. Try it. Seven, I actually mentioned this once already. You need to sell yourself. Market yourself to the interviewer. You got the interview, what was on paper or what you sent online through email, that, that got you in the chair. Now sell yourself, market yourself. Why are you the best candidate for this job? Because guess what? There's going to be a bazillion other candidates out there that have exactly the same experience, have exactly the same level of certification as you do. There are going to be a bunch of new grads that are going to interview for the same position. How do you stick out from the crowd? What makes you different? What makes you better? How can you convince the interviewer that you are the person for the job? Number eight, I would use your phone as a way to remember persons, places, and things. It's important to remember names to remember positions, and to remember kind of locations. And you can do these either on the go, when you have a break, do it right after you finished the whatever piece of the interview, jot it down in the notes app of your phone, do a little recording, a dictation, break out your portfolio, write it down on a piece of paper. One of, the, one of the best kept secrets is that if you can remember people's names and know their position later down the line or during the interview process when you go to the second or third stage of the interview and someone asks, oh, where have you, where have you been? Who have you been talking to so far? And you can say to them, yeah, I was talking with I already talked with Dr. Smith, Dr. Jones, and Dr. Betsy. Those are the three that they do this, they do that. We were over here and we did this. That tells the interviewer you have attention to detail and that this is important to you. Oh, and it also help you in one of these other tips that I mentioned. Number nine, send a thank you card. Oh my God, send a thank you card. A written, handwritten thank you card to whomever it is that coordinated the interview, whoever it is is in charge of what happened. Don't send it to HR. Send it to the person that you interviewed with. Send it to the person or persons that are making the decision to say, hey, HR, human resources, hey, HR, we're going to go ahead and hire that person that we interviewed today because we really like them. 
you need to send a thank you card to those individuals. And you should do it the very next day of your interview. I don't care if it's on a Saturday or Sunday. Send that bad boy in the mail. I don't care if it was an online interview. Send a thank you card. It goes a long way. It delivers one heck of an impression. I don't know about you, but if I'm hiring... And if I got new grad A and new grad B who have pretty much interviewed almost carbon copy, but new grad B sent me a thank you card, guess who I'm hiring? Number 10, follow up. Follow up with them after a certain number of days. It's important way back when I said about the time frame, knowing how soon they will be making a decision. When that time frame gets closer, you need to call someone and talk to a human being. You might only get to the HR department. You're going to have to live with that sometimes. But I would highly recommend following up with whomever it is that you spoke with. Follow up with the people that you interviewed with because during the interview, you're going to ask for their business card. You're going to ask for a point of contact. And then you're going to ask, is it okay if I call you? Oh, thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you for taking the time to uh, speak with me. I was wondering, do you have a business card, a point of contact? And it, would it be okay if I message or call you to follow up? And they could flat out say no, and that's okay. You at least ask the question. You're not, you won't know unless you ask the question. But you need to be confident and mildly aggressive because that also shows that you want the freaking job. So, do everything in your power to leave a lasting impression. Follow up with them after however many days. I wouldn't wait any more than a week. And if you've been able to wait a week without going insane, my hat's off to you because I couldn't wait two days. I couldn't wait. I think it took close to a week. Probably one of the longest weeks I've ever had in my life. Yeah, almost about a week before I got an answer. And I got, a, I got a verbal answer first, and then I got, a, I got the snail mail letter of acceptance probably another five days later. So if I were you, call them. There you go. Ten must-have tips for the nurse practitioner interviewing process. There are a lot more out there, but these are the things that I think you must have in order to get that job. If you got any more tips or tricks, anything that helped you, anything that didn't help you, please leave them down in the comments. You know I love hearing from you. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the channel and share the vlog and pass it on. And as always, check your own pulse first.